receta de grupo, eh, la vale. ¿Vale? Si tenéis al modelo, para que pase. Para esto he quedado, ya. Para esto he quedado, para hacer el modelo. Vale. Eh, pero se supone que. Yo tengo el modelo también. ¿Me mola? 10 euros. Se supone que ahí vamos a pagar los micros. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
No, actually, yo aprendo español, pero inglés es muy fácil. Okay, so today uh, I'd like to get your attention about Terraform modules and a little bit more. So during my talk, I know that it may be uh, not uh, so easy for you, but feel free to interrupt me as soon as you start uh, losing what I'm trying to tell you. Because it may be very obvious for me, because I work with these things for many years, and it may be not so easy for some of you who don't know what I'm talking about. So today we'll talk about uh, different things, like what is it, some introduction, and then we'll talk about frequent Terraform questions, which uh, I managed to, <coughs> to pick up from the community, from different people who I talked to, and uh, kind of aggregate it. And uh, then we'll move to my favorite topic, which is Terraform modules. You will understand why it's my favorite. And then there will be a session of questions and answers. Uh, preferably questions will come from you. Answers may be coming from me as well. Maybe some of you will be able to help each other. We'll see. And uh, bar and coffee talk if there will be some people left by this time. Okay? So, yes, my name is uh, Anton Babenko. I live in Norway and uh, I'm originally from Ukraine. So for the last uh, three to five years, I was involved in Terraform and AWS quite actively. So I organize uh, uh, lots of events uh, in Norway, and uh, the next one, which is pretty big, is going to be DevOps Days Oslo. Uh, and yeah, as you probably have heard about uh, me before, most likely you saw my contributions on uh, GitHub, because uh, approximately 90% of what I do ended up as open source at one form or another. So uh, some of my projects related to this talk include Terraform community modules, uh, which started back in the days of about Terraform 06, maybe. And uh, then uh, I made Terraform AWS modules, which is a collection of verified Terraform AWS modules. And they are verified by community and by HashiCorp. Uh, and uh, then just proof of concept I made, I wanted to make a tool to simplify my own life so that uh, modules can be generated uh, and they are still uh, used by community. So I made Terrapin, which is proof of concept. Then I made pre-commit Terraform to make uh, my uh, Terraform configurations uh, clean and valid. So this seems to be used by some people. Uh, last week, I open source modules TF uh, as AWS Lambda function uh, to Terraform configuration code from visual diagrams, uh, which I think is pretty cool, at least for people who like to draw things, but maybe not so cool if you uh, like to have everything as code. So I try to fill this gap where you can draw something and get something practical and useful as code. And uh, since I'm staying at Airbnb and it was hot outside, so I managed to write some Terraform best practices uh, as I uh, was preparing for this talk. So uh, the last link is very much a uh, work in progress. Uh, it is the result of uh, work for, uh, of uh, many people in the community who either uh, wrote different blog posts, ask questions, answer questions, or send emails to me or send emails to mailing lists lots of different uh, sources for this. But uh, Terraform best practice, uh, the, way, uh, the way I publish it, is primarily my vision of what is going to work and why it's going to be uh, good for you to use. It's uh, totally opinionated. Uh, I want to, uh, by publishing this, I want to get some attention from the people who can tell me clearly that, oh, this is bullshit, this is not going to work. And then we will discuss, okay? Not before. So that's why I publish it. So uh, occasionally I tweet something. Uh, again, all of my tweets are about Terraform or AWS. So that's what I do. And I also sometimes write different blog posts. So yeah, I like open source. So one big event which is going to happen in October is going to be HashiConf. Uh, first day of workshop and uh, then a couple days of uh, Talks. Uh, as far as I remember, there will be about 400 people from around the globe, uh, lots of people with uh, similar problems as you are facing, 
lots of uh, users and lots of uh, experience back. So if you have possibility to go there, I would really recommend to go there. If you uh, want to go there but ticket seems expensive, please come to and talk to me. It will not be cheaper, but I can tell you something. So uh, what is HashiCorp? Uh, I guess you had uh, some uh, thoughts about why HashiCorp and what kind of tools they have and uh, what, what is all this about, right? So let me ask the question, uh, who here knows what is HashiCorp uh, as a company and what kind of tools they have? Like actually half of people, I guess you are actually using half of this, right? Again, so same amount of people uh, know what is it and they use it. It's funny, but there are no logos. No, here is one. Ah, I copied it. So, right. So on this slide, we can see the whole uh, application delivery life cycle, where it starts from the top, where developers write code, then they somehow test it, package, make infrastructure, deploy, and then connect all of these things together. Pretty uh, traditional, I would say, application delivery life cycle. But what HashiCorp is doing is actually providing tools for all of this, where uh, uh, we are not going to talk about any of this tool except this one, uh, Terraform. So I can say that this is Vagrant, this is Packer, uh, and this is Nomad, and this is Console, and all of this is secured using Vault. So why uh, to use uh, Terraform? That's one of the biggest questions which uh, people can think about. There are already a lot of tools, but why Terraform? Okay, initial statement for the Terraform was very easy. This is a tool which can write, plan, and create infrastructure as code. Nothing else, that's it. So you have this easy to understand file where you have a uh, dec declaration of uh, resources like AWS S3 bucket uh, and uh, then you want to output this uh, bucket ID here. So then you run Terraform in it to download some dependencies and uh, you see what is going to happen which you then confirm as yes, I want to have this uh, created and then in the end you have this bucket ID here. So that's the whole, uh, the core principle of infrastructure as code, where you define first, then you run some command, and you can reproduce it over and over. That's one of the principles uh, which infrastructure as code is for. But uh, we may think that, okay, but there is cloud formation, there is uh, Google Cloud Deployment Manager, there is Azure Resource Manager. All of these are doing the same things. Right, that's a very good statement because all of these are doing the same things for their own cloud providers. And uh, it may be very hard or literally impossible to connect uh, some of these resources and let's say mix uh, and mesh different uh, providers. So instead of using all of these three things, we can use just one thing, okay? So we don't need to know AWS cloud formation specific, YAML, JSON, Magic, whatever. Google Cloud, YAML, Magic, Python, Jinja, and Azure, whatever they use, wrapped in JSON. So instead, we write something in Terraform, which is potentially easier. Right. But what about other providers, which are DNS, uh, PagerDuty, Matrix, Lux, um, New Relic Matrix, uh, G Suite accounts, Dropbox files? All of these are still uh, infrastructure, and they still can be retrieved, updated, uh, deleted. So wouldn't it be cool to actually use uh, one tool to get access to all of these providers at once? So often uh, the question which I hear is uh, why on earth I should use anything else than a uh, tool which is provided for me by my cloud provider? So most typical example is that people are familiar with cloud formation and they don't want to look into anything else. That's typical, typical situation, I would say, because AWS is not providing uh, any support for Terraform, right? So you will not know about Terraform unless you really dive into documentation, into click, click, click from AWS side. So uh, Terraform, uh, just uh, as some of you already read, I just want to highlight that uh, it has easier syntax and it has native support for modules and remote states and a few other things. And it's open source. So you really can see what's 
uh, what's going to, to be developed, or, or you can even affect when certain feature will be implemented. Uh, you can actually start writing code to implement this feature, or you can provide some feedback about different features. So that's the beauty of open source. I'm actually glad that we are uh, in the company whose statement was enterprise and open source. I thought we are on the wrong floor. But yeah, it's kind of cool that enterprise and open source. And the way how Terraform is doing is uh, by uh, building a building, uh, graph of all the resources and connection between them. So that uh, um, back in the days, Terraform was faster than AWS cloud formation for creation of similar amount of resources. Uh, again, back in the day, and it's still the case, there are some features which are released uh, in Terraform earlier then they become supported by CloudFormation. So that's the beauty of open source, that if there is something missing and this feature is already supported in SDK, then it's very uh, uh, strange that it's not in Terraform. There are certain limitations why not everything is in Terraform, but that's a pretty big discussion for, for later. So let's uh, move on. So what is Terraform goal again? So we have a unified view of all resources in infrastructure. And uh, it has coverage for a variety of infrastructures called platform as called software as a service, whatever. And uh, we, uh, w everything what we are describing in HCL is going to be uh, uh, is going to be talking just uh, for API, just just talking using API. So the only thing which is uh, available is c can be supported by Terraform. So another thing which is, uh, I even underlined this word, it's not very typical for me. You see most of my slides are on back, black background, but this word is really underlined. That's because I believe that this is a good candidate to be a universal tool. Universal tool, not just looking into resources which you create on your cloud provider right now, but as I said earlier, you have uh, lots of uh, different providers around. Being as an extreme example, you can think about this as that you uh, during onboarding process, you uh, you create a simple uh, piece of uh, HCL code where you describe uh, what is first name, last name, which department, whether he has to get access to this AWS account, uh, what his uh, Gmail um, username should be, uh, what kind of new relic access he should get, whether he should be able to access Jira, and what kind of uh, Datadog permission can this user have. Imagine doing all of this in one, uh, in one, uh, in one module or in, mo in one HCL file. Previously, you used to click lots of links and you have to remember all of usernames, passwords everywhere. But since all of these uh, uh, platforms are having an API already, uh, it would be strange to not use it. And imagine that you can manage life cycle of all of these resources using code. So there are lots of different solutions uh, out there, and uh, it's very hard to figure out which one uh, is going to be relevant for, for your specific need or for your specific provider. So I just pick up uh, five which are uh, really uh, used by literally everyone or not everyone, but they are powerful enough to cover lots of needs for everyone. So the first one is Terraform Registry, is a collection of public Terraform modules for common infrastructure uh, blocks. So that's the place where I maintain Terraform AWS modules, and uh, Terraform AWS modules are by far the most popular there. Uh, it has its own problems, uh, like why it is so. It's not because AWS is used much more than everything else. It's just hard to uh, find someone who is willing to maintain these things for the other providers. And also, if you have a uh, possibility to run Terraform plan, you will see some uh, things which are going to be happening. But uh, sometimes you want to put a little bit values which you are specifying are actually correct. For example, if you specify uh, AMI ID, uh, TFLint will actually talk to AWS and will verify that this AMI ID actually exists and you actually have access to it before 
Iranian telephone code uh, which will fail because this AMI doesn't exist, for example, and a few other things. Uh, JSONnet is uh, is going to be used uh, not so much because uh, Terraform 012 is coming and there are lots of solutions for this one. Mm. Right, so another one uh, tool which is uh, very interesting for from my perspective is because if we look into uh, the whole Terraform scope, we have uh, projects, uh, oh, we have open source Terraform, right, which is CLI, which you can download for free, you can run on your computer, on CI server, that's fine. You can do this for pretty long time. But uh, if you are a huge bank with lots of money with few developers, you can go and pay for enterprise version. Enterprise version requires a lot of money, so you have to find balance between having more developers or affording enterprise. So it's, it's really expensive. So Atlantis is one of these tools which stays between open source totally free and enterprise terribly expensive. So Atlantis is a way to run uh, similar commands as you would do from your machine, but uh, run it from central place. So you, you can go to this website and see a nice video which Luke, the, uh, the maintainer of this project, made, and you can get a clue what is this about. But think about this, is that this is a centralized way of running your Terraform configuration, uh, and don't let developers to have full access to it. It has still lots of challenges, lots of limitations, but it's on its way to success. Does anyone use this now? Or looked at it? No. Yeah. Yeah, so running it on Jenkins Server uh, is probably a, like old fashioned way. Because uh, one thing which is, uh, which at least I believe in too, is that if there are things which you don't have to manage, you don't have to manage them. Right, so this is exactly the use case. You have to uh, have just Docker image which run this Atlantis server, which is available for GitHub to access, and that's it. Mm. So if, if you're interested to get a try this one, uh, I open source uh, Terraform AWS module for running Atlantis on AWS Fargate. Uh, yeah, so this means that uh, you don't have to manage infrastructure for this one. Okay, another one, uh, Terragrant. Does anyone uh, use Terragrant? Cool, just one, come on. It's one of the best tools out there. It exists for uh, at least a couple of years. Okay, so a long time ago you used Terragrant, and you know what, since that time they didn't have logo. So maybe somebody can uh, come up with ideas. Because you see, this one has logo and this one doesn't. Yeah. So I open issue and people should participate and uh, come up with ideas, but no one contributed. So uh, what Terragrant is doing? Think about this as, uh, um, you can read this sentence, but I will try to say it my words, is that uh, over some time you was writing Terraform files. You describe resources, variables, outputs, and you do this pretty repetitive process for different stacks over and over. Then you figure out that, oh, there are some rep repetition between company A where I worked and company B where I work now. So it's probably a good idea to run it, uh, to extract it as a module and copy paste it. That's an idea which I had uh, when I come up with uh, Terraform modules back in the days. So that uh, I work as contractor and why should I write the same code if I can open source and tell the company that, hey, I maintain this stuff, so you should hire me and I will continue maintaining this. So this worked pretty well, but Terragram saved me even further, so that when I try to combine these modules, uh, these infrastructure modules or resource module, uh, to satisfy needs of specific customer, Terragram does heavy lifting for me. So Terragram expect me, just give me URL where this module is and what keys and values this module expects. And the rest of copy pasting, Terragram does for itself. So uh, at the end, Terragram uh, allows to have much fewer uh, code to maintain and uh, very easy to explain to customers and to teams uh, I work with uh, what they have to change in order for their projects to be up and running. 
they don't have to know any details about how uh, Terraform is working, how resources are configured. That's totally hidden for them. They can definitely look into source code and figure out what's going on, but uh, the idea is that you hide whatever is not necessary for them to know. And this is why Terra is pretty good. Hopefully, bottom sentence is similar. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Another question which is pretty often uh, from the community is after they read some documentation, they see on some, uh, on some pages there are some scary notes that oh, make sure that you don't put your safety information here because it will be persisted on state files, so maybe you should do something else. And uh, over some time uh, I discovered that there are at least this six ways if you cannot uh, tolerate existence of uh, secrets inside your uh, state file. So actually uh, there are six ways uh, which I described here, but uh, in fact there are even more ways to satisfy this because you can always invoke AWS Lambda to generalize it, but uh, if possible you can use PGP with key base to uh, be able to manage your IAM Users, uh, users and access keys. Uh, so this way it will be encrypted and it will be stored inside a uh, state file, but uh, it will be possible to decrypt only for the user of this key base, which was used to encrypt, which is pretty good. So everyone can get the state file, but it's encrypted. Uh, a very common solution for relational database servers is that you set some dummy password, which is yes, it will be persisted in TF state file, but you change it right after database was created. It has some drawbacks because there will still be time and still be situation where you uh, create something but didn't change password yet, but it's possible to change this execution so that it will be no problems. Uh, one of the recent addition was AWS Secret Manager servers. Uh, which allows you to manage secrets and get them uh, by different AWS uh, EC2 instances, for example, uh, and it can rotate them uh, for you. The only downside is that if you have uh, a lot of secrets, it will be expensive. As far as I remember, it's like one dollar or yeah, about one dollar per secret or something like this, which is yeah, a lot. If you have a lot of them, you can calculate. I mean. You can multiply. <laughs> um, yeah, and oh, good. I forgot one more thing here. So actually, number seven is that there is a, there are certain utilities which people come up over time to encrypt values in state file. Uh, one of these utility is called uh, Terra Help. Terra Help uh, by Nikki from OpenCreda, and uh, she wrote this tool. Uh, pretty long time ago, about a couple of years ago, when uh, there was an urgent need to make sure that even if you get access to your state file and it contains some secret stuff, the state file is encrypted, uh, as far as I remember, with PGP as well. And quite recently, like one year ago, there was addition to make, uh, to make it possible to encrypt with secrets with Vault or something like this. So Vault is involved. So in order to use TerraHelp, you now have to manage Vault as well, which is m probably a good idea if you already have Vault, but uh, not so good for the majority of cases. So uh, other options which people tend to implement uh, right out of the box is uh, just make sure that your remote state location uh, is restricted by uh, S3 bucket policy uh, or using KMS key to encrypt at rest. Uh, that's usually enough. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was uh, whether there is a way to uh, intercept with Terraform behavior and uh, uh, add hook which uh, is uh, going to be executed once uh, Terraform wants to push to state file. Right? 
uh, as far as I understand, there is no way and there will be no way like this in the future because uh, Terraform should not be so smart in these cases. So what people are uh, willing to do, or what people are doing right now, is that they wrap a lot of things around Terraform. So that's like one of the problem uh, with Terraform. If you have problem with anything, you tend to make the easy solution first. Right, I want you know. Oh, I know Bash. So let's make wrapper which will encrypt something, which will do something, which will push something. So then you have your own bicycle. Uh, like two, three years ago, it was a good, uh, I think, tradition for any company in the world to make their own wrapper uh, for Terraform. And this was exactly use case. So uh, if we look into how uh, how you can um, intercept with uh, Terraform behavior uh, from the module, there is no way. So if you need to do something after code is executed, the best example is to use uh, either outputs or new provider to execute some code after your infrastructure has been created. So n n null resource, uh, null resource uh, you can use to call your shell script after something has been done. But natively, there is no support for Terraform. And think about this uh, also as Terraform should be universal. Uh, I believe that not everybody is using AWS here. <laughs> so, and it's, it's hard to figure out whether we have to rely on KMS or not. So there are a lot of companies who are using Terraform and they make tools just for their specific usage of Terraform. So some uh, create tools specifically for Terraform and the AWS. Some create the same for Google. So that's probably answering your question, as you just said, that you can have null resource uh, which is going to be triggered after something has been created. So after this is created, then there will be this uh, AWS CLI command executed with this web ACL. So if you have this resource block in your code, then it will be invoked after everything is uh, created. So that's exactly the way how you can change password on a relational database server. Mm. So Terraform modules. So we finished uh, the kind of the easiest part where we talked about uh, what we talked about. We talked about tools, we talked about why to use Terraform, and it was pretty straightforward, right? So uh, I'd like to talk about Terraform modules, and uh, uh, there are certain things which are different in Terraform modules. So I made this fancy diagram during weekends because I want to actually illustrate how you can think about Terraform configuration codes in a pretty effective way. So that on the top of this, you have infrastructure composition, which is, if we look from the bottom, then we have, this is the, the place where you define uh, what kind of uh, infrastructure and resource modules you want to invoke. In this diagram, you invoke in one infrastructure module. Right? And you can also specify which region I'm going to be working with, which environment is it, which version of my modules I need to invoke. So that's like your highest level. That's where Terragrant is awesome. If we look deeper, then we see that there is infrastructure module which is invoking some data sources and uh, which is also invoking some resource modules to create something small. Uh, as you can guess by names, that resource modules are just creating resources. And they do this in a very flexible way. So they don't have almost any limitations, uh, any restrictions. The most suitable restriction which you can think about resource module is to help user to provide correct uh, inputs. For example, if uh, some resource should not contain dash at the end, then you simply have to cut it. Uh, that's the maximum what resource module should be doing. Um, and it has no relation to anything else. It's very isolated. I'm talking about this resource module. And the uh, infrastructure module is often uh, something in between where you actually implement 
things which either Terraform is not able to provide you right now, or you have to enforce some company-wide standards on naming or tagging. Uh, that's exactly where you have to do this. So your infrastructure module, think about this, that your infrastructure module consists of a bunch of resources. And instead of dealing with resources one by one and try to combine them on infrastructure level, you put them into a little bit bigger group, which is called resource module. So infrastructure module is also a good place to use a uh, tool like JSONnet to generate some uh, JSON structure. So for those who don't know, Terraform can be used uh, with HCL or with JSON. Details way here on this URL, uh, which is again open source. So if you find anything what you disagree or you think should be improved or simply delete or simply totally worthless, please open pull request and we can discuss it there. Maybe I will agree to you. Okay, so um, over some time uh, working with uh, Terraform modules, I start to figure out uh, what is actually a good module or bad module and how they're different. Uh, I maintain Terraform AWS modules, which are uh, which were downloaded more than one and a half millions of times during. Most people are using them in pretty different combinations. And uh, I think one of the reasons why people are using them is because it's really feature rich. Not because it's clean code. No, sometimes it's not clean code. Uh, and that's okay. I mean, it, as long as it does what it should be doing, it's okay. But it's really feature rich. If you say that you want to make a VPC, believe me, there are 52 input arguments which you can specify for, uh, for VPC. This includes crazy combination, crazy amount of subnets, uh, and this includes even type of subnets which uh, is not used anywhere. Like literally, I used to dive into RFC to figure out that, oh my god, this type of subnet really exists. I mean, it's not just public and private, it's called intranet. It's where you don't have, you have private subnet, but without access to the intranet. It's like private subnet, but without NAT gateway which is very uh, popular demand for Lambda functions, for example. So and so, and more of this uh, is exactly the reason why uh, these modules are used. Uh, they have same default uh, means that uh, uh, most likely, uh, if you just invoke this module, you will get nothing, which means you don't have to disable a lot of things to make things going. So if you specify that you need to create security group, uh, and don't specify anything, there will be no security group because you didn't specify it. So there will be no crazy errors uh, which are pretty tricky in Terraform because they often look like as encrypted magic, which is error in this line. And you sit and guess why, where, if you inherit it many times. Yeah. Uh, tests is probably one of the strangest parts. I don't believe in infrastructure modules testing at all because uh, I think that uh, there are so many variants, so many combinations. As I said, VPC module has 52, um, uh, 52 um, input arguments. So what kind of 52 factorial I should make or what kind of uh, test I should introduce? I mean, I, I'm open to some discussion about that, but I don't believe that uh, test should be very generic and will try to cover a lot of things. I've been into several discussions where people want to add tests simply because they have tests for their application. Fine, you can test it once you create something, or you can test your real infrastructure once it was created, but it's not job of the infrastructure or resource module to do that. Because again, resource module is totally stupid. It accepts whatever you tell to it, and it will make it. If you specify strange values, um, Okay, it will make it, but you just specify it. So I really am uh, not sure what to do with tests. So far, uh, uh, only one module which I maintain has tests, simply because guy who uh, who said that uh, he will not use this module without tests, and I said, okay, you can add it. So since that time, I didn't change the test. So I'm sure that it's broken. 
but, but it's okay. I mean, uh, right now the situation we're testing in the Terraform uh, scope is is not so good and is not uh, is not so uh, changing. I would say. Does anyone know what is Terra test? Right, so uh, what's your experience with this one? Can you tell? So Terra test, Terra test just so that Yeah. Right, so the thing is that, I don't know if I should repeat question or is it recorded? No? Okay. So, yeah, I just asked uh, what is uh, Terra test. So the Terra test is, uh, uh, is a way of writing infrastructure tests uh, in Golang, uh, which you run on real infrastructure, something like this. So the, uh, w where most people are lost in uh, writing Go code. Believe me, I was in a situation where it was hard to explain to people that, hey, this is uh, Terraform, it's not so hard to uh, learn it. And they say, no, it's very hard, so okay, then we use Terragram. Are you happy with this structure? Yes, I'm happy. Now if I go to them and say, hey guys, you're a Java developer, no problem, you have to write this Go code, which uh, looks very different from what I just convinced you, that Terraform is easier because it's HCL, and now I say, hey guys, you have to write this Go code. So I lost another half of audience. <laughs> uh, another problem which is uh, uh, more problematic, I would say, is uh, what you're actually trying to cover is uh, much more complicated uh, than it may seem. Because what TerraTest is doing is going to your real infrastructure, creating this infra that these resources present, that this resource is configured in correct way. For me, it seems a little bit uh, like trust no one. I mean, I trust uh, AWS that it returned proper exit code to Terraform, and I trust TS state file. What possibly can go wrong? <laughs> so it's it's a big topic, and uh, I'm looking forward to hear some discussion uh, at HashiConf. I hope there will be some announcements. Uh, Examples. Examples in uh, modules is one of these, uh, the most, uh, how to say, the strangest part of uh, Terraform modules for me is that people don't respect examples. Examples were written for the reason to be absolutely working the way it is described in README MD. And not more, not less. All tests without any exceptions or all examples are uh, executing something real uh, only if you run Terraform init, Terraform plan, Terraform apply. Only these commands. You will never have to specify any uh, extra details like, uh, uh, by the way, use this region, or by the way, uh, I, I use this specific feature. All of this is, used, uh, is using data source to find your VPC, your default security group, and so on. So you don't have to uh, be very creative and think about tests like, oh yeah, thanks for writing this test, but I know that this is boring, so I will open an issue when I will ask you exactly the same question. So it's, it happens quite often when I have to answer somebody and say, hey, by the way, you have to check example because uh, that's the place, that's like contract between this code and that it works. That's how I verify most of code right now, is that I go to examples directory, me or some automation system, and just execute example, usually with name complete. Complete is uh, like keyword, which I use internally, which means it will create something in very complicated uh, setup, which most likely will catch your error. So test and example, they're very close here. But again, examples are real uh, tests. So I, I test, again, absolutely real things. I test that, yes, you have default security group because it's always there. I guess you have VPC. I guess you have this set of resources. And I just pass them into the module which I'm testing. Uh, documentation is pretty funny thing. When I talk to people from uh, US and uh, say to them, hey, guys, you're an English speaker. I'm not. 
why it's so hard for you to write good documentation or any documentation they always say like yeah but nobody will read it but believe me or not uh, any documentation is better than no documentation so that's how I started writing uh, read me into into modules which I maintain it's just by writing whatever I feel may be applicable and then somehow group it around and then see people actually contribute it and add another paragraph another chapter and sometimes readme gets big and big but it's better than nothing if there are thousands of grammar mistakes no problem I mean it's probably my problem but uh, sometimes I fix them uh, or other people sometimes even English speaker helper uh, help me and send an email and say hey you know you made so many mistakes this is correct one so I just copy paste and but I think that any documentation is better I can I can write much better in Russian for example but nobody would read it so yeah uh, many other things which are outside of this uh, scope is like how to guarantee that your module is actually doing what you uh, expect it to do like if I say that this is VPC module do you need I am access credentials do you need to, to uh, have a chance to create users or do you need to destroy instances so there are uh, if you are using any module right now you trust 100% of this module creator you have no control uh, like that this uh, module will not suddenly be compromised and new feature will be added so that everything is broken same with uh, lifecycle readiness I was uh, beaten with this multiple times uh, pretty funny situations happen sometimes is when I change something like uh, I changed some uh, name of resource uh, let's say now and uh, then I figure out oh I made some mistake so I, I changed slightly different things and I pushed new version and then during this half hour one guy managed to download this module create something with this and then uh, he run it again and it destroyed what he just created so the existence of this uh, uh, of this version was like one hour maximum and he managed to find that this uh, bug was introduced or this uh, uh, so he used during this one hour and he destroyed half of his infrastructure whatever happened and he opened an issue so that's one of the reasons why you really have to specify version I mean yes versioning is very hard uh, versioning in, in general with modules is pain in the ass like it's dependency hell but in HCL um, one of the idea with versioning is that you just have to specify as precise as you can most of uh, modules which are which at least I saw in uh, public they are not following semantic version versioning entirely because uh, it's it, it, otherwise if we would follow semantic version in uh, it would be uh, like uh, Mozilla Firefox version 57.10.10 25 instead we don't increase major versions so much we increase minor and patch so that's why some modules have like one means that it, it has been created somehow sometime and uh, when it will be absolutely non-working with previous version then it will be two but in general we just increase minor version and it's okay um, I still have difficulties with generating change log so if you have some good ideas how to generate change log in a uh, faultless way without asking people but uh, rather use some uh, tooling around it uh, I would really appreciate it because right now uh, I have actually some people from I think from Madrid uh, open issue a long time ago that hey was it you? Yeah. 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 yeah cool yeah so you see <laughs> small world so uh, yeah so uh, making change log uh, helpful is very uh, complicated work for me to do so in general and uh, not just for me but uh, I can say quite honestly that modules which I maintain they're in much better shape than majority of other modules simply because it's not just shameless plug but that's uh, the fact that uh, I spent uh, time thinking about all of these aspects like full time I'm not get paid by HashiCorp to do this but it's just fun for me and people are using it so I, I fix it and change log is outside of my scope for now so that's it uh, 
uh, Terraform AWS modules, they are used by, uh, yeah, they contributed uh, more than hundreds of people, including you. <laughs> all kind of documentation, all, all kind of opening issues or discussion with other people, all of this helps. Especially when I was on vacation, I made a pretty good experiment myself. I wanted to verify whether open source community is sustainable, so I went on vacation for 45 days without any single commit, any single merge. And the only thing which I noted was that uh, a lot of people became, uh, forked uh, several modules and they actually continue developing in their fork. Why? So what I'd normally do, is like what I did uh, before that, is that I monitor a network of forks. And if I see something cool, I submit a pull request from his branch into my branch. <laughs> Why not? So this time I, uh, I also do similar things, especially if people made more or less uh, big progress. If it's just small thing, uh, of course I'm not gonna to take it, but I usually uh, ask people to contribute back because that's how open source work, at least I think. And uh, more than 100 developers are thinking the same. So far we have a bunch of uh, I would say it's limited amount of modules. Why it's limited is because uh, this process is not scaling right now. There is one human writing all of this, pushing all of this, testing all of this, or some of this, and this process is very, very um, uh, kind of hard to scale. That's why I, I, I will look into details like how to increase this amount, because amount of resources which Terraform can manage right now is more than a couple thousand uh, of resources. And we can have here like one, two, three, four, ten resources. Maybe not ten, maybe fifty resources. That's not enough. So what about all these crazy services which are happening like in AWS every time? With Google it's quite different. Google has its own magic, which is called magic modules. So, oh my god, another, who knows what is it? One. Cool. He actually didn't know this before I tell him. So, ha did anyone see this one before? Cool. So more people, more people than usually. So this is produced by Cloudcraft, and uh, uh, it's used by cloud architect to design and to draw all of these things, to move boxes, to connect different, um, uh, different, um, different components together. Uh, to put some values like what type of instance, what type of load balancer is it, and so on. So they they really like these things. They like to move different boxes and so on. As I showed earlier, I, I'm writing uh, Terraform best practices guide now, where I'm actually thinking what are the best ways to generate this specific infrastructure as Terraform, which is very uh, wide question. Uh, if we ask now, I will guess there will be at least 20 different solutions. Like somebody will say, oh, this is okay to describe it in all, all resources in one file. Fine. Somebody may say, oh, let's think about this availability zone as one file and this is another file. And so on. You, so you get the point. There will be lots of different combinations. Most uh, straightforward one, which uh, is actually happening in, in real life, is thinking about this as layer, so that you have a mm, layer called Elastic Load Balancer, then you have a layer called Auto Scaling Group, then you have another layer which is Elastic Load Balancer, another Auto Scaling Group, and RDS. So you, you think about this as layer, the way, uh, uh, the way you look at this is exactly as layer. So once user hits something, he hits this one, he hits this uh, Auto Scaling Group, another Load Balancer, and so on. So that's, that's exactly the approach which, uh, yeah, that's kind of features of Cloudcraft. Um, calculate the budget, a lot of people really like to know how much they're going to spend. Um, and import live infrastructure is also you go in AWS console, you click like cowboy everywhere, you created all of this bunch of things and then you think like, oh my God, there is DevOps, there is infrastructure as code, what to do now? So you import everything here. Uh, wouldn't it be cool to actually uh, get from this Cloudcraft diagram as we saw now into 
opinionated structure of Terraform the way we just uh, talked about it as layers. Because layers, again, is one of the most uh, powerful approach which people are using. And uh, then from Terraform, we can execute it into AWS and get this infrastructure created. And then again, we can use the import feature from CloudCraft to update some things here. That's like real ideal world. So you have console, you have diagram, you have infrastructure as code, and you have modules TF. So this is my project which I released last uh, week. Again, it's open source, 100% free, and uh, it's infrastructure as code generator from various sources. I started with uh, uh, CloudCraft simply because this is awesome project and they pay money, but uh, I believe that anything what you can use uh, to describe your infrastructure, think about this as text file, or it can be another drawing tool or it can be XML file, which is just your proprietary balsamic or draw.io is using. Anything like that. All of this it can be generated as Terraform code. So you have CloudCraft, you have a bunch of already existing uh, Terraform AWS modules, which are literally a building block. And you have Terraform, which is the tool which actually does uh, the infrastructure as code. So right now it is deployed here, if you add this question mark beta, you can see how it's working. And um, the idea is that uh, right now it suits best for bootstrapping. So it's not so smart as majority of you guys, or actually as any of you, as all of you, I don't know how to say it in English, but uh, this tool is absolutely stupid. This tool is uh, just uh, trying its best to uh, find resources it knows about uh, figure out connection between all of these tools, uh, all of these uh, components, and uh, it tries to enforce Terraform best practices by putting this code into proper places. And uh, in my experience, it suits very best for bootstrapping because you don't have to create, like, uh, I don't know, for, for this specific example, uh, you don't have to create about maybe uh, 10 kilobytes of code, maybe more. So I think it's pretty good saving. And it's open source, of course. Uh, yeah, if you want to sponsor our sticker, sticker, come on. Good. Then contact me. I have a bunch of uh, different stickers with me. So what's next? Uh, as I said earlier, involve more people and code generators. It's very important to actually uh, use code generators because involving people is very hard. Really, it's so hard that uh, over um, I would say three years working with Terraform AWS modules, uh, I had maybe five guys in total who contacted me and say, hey, we want to contribute this module. And they were flexible enough to adjust their preferences, their way of thinking to be compatible with the rest of things. All other people wanted just, hey, this is my module which is like no documentation, no example, nothing. Just throw it to me and then I have to maintain it. That's not uh, the way how I want to work. So I made this Terrapin uh, thing and now I made this modules TF. Terrapin is proof of concept in Python, Jinja, which is very hard to convince. Like, again, guys, you like uh, HCL, but I want you to write Jinja template, which smells so I will probably rewrite it to HCL. Um, and uh, a pretty funny thing which is happening right now, I guess uh, not everyone is using Terraform on big scale on, let's say, for two, three years with hundreds of developers. But that's exactly the use case which I see. Terraform is one of these tools which is very easy to get started. And then you sell uh, to different teams and they are hooked up and say, yeah, I can write my code, I can push something. You see I have infrastructure there. And then uh, over some time, you have lots of lots of lots of snowflakes between team, projects. Uh, within one organization, you can have like no structure. Again, that's one of the reasons why I want to enforce best practices and uh, uh, want to hear what other people are thinking. Because uh, Terraform refactoring is one of these tools, or one of these problems, which is already a real challenge for companies who were creating lots of these things, 
what they should do now when they have everything written in so different style. So just for my own uh, uh, experiments, I made Terrible, which is Terraform plus Ansible, of course. <laughs> so I use Ansible to orchestrate Terraform to do some refactoring. Yeah, it looks uh, it looks exactly terrible. And I use make file so that make terrible plan or make terrible apply. Uh, yeah, so I use it uh, for internal refactoring, for example, when I had about uh, 50 different projects which were structured pretty differently. I want to make sure that everyone was using the latest version of our internal infrastructure module, uh, which is, uh, let's say, 1.1.1. 1 .1 1. And I want to search every uh, code base and uh, update it gracefully. Gracefully means that I, I do recursive operation in each of these folders. Like, I find this project, okay, they're using l not latest version, I run plan, and then I run apply, and then I go to another project, and so on. So that's exactly the idea of Terrible. Ansible is not good fit for that one at all. So I'm r really glad with the name, most of all. So dependency help problem with modules. Who, who has been trying to figure out which version to specify in module, in Terraform, and in provider? So right now you have to do this in three different places. And you, you, have, to, you have provider configuration, where you specify specific version of provider. You have Terraform, where you specify, again, something. And then you have module, which is specifying mm, just module version. So right now, this magic is very hard to uh, predict what's going to happen, especially if people are making very bad mistakes by putting provider configuration into the module itself, which means that you cannot override it and you cannot do anything with it. So that's really an important use case because I, I once uh, made this mistake myself in, uh, I think, in security group module, where a new feature was introduced uh, in specific version of uh, AWS provider. So I thought, what possibly can go wrong if I just add provider configuration into main TF on this uh, security group module? And I didn't do anything else than just specifying provider and version more than specific number. I don't remember now. And uh, I push it. Again, it took uh, less than half hour for someone to discover that it breaks everything for him because he is actually configuring provider sections on the very high level, on the composition level, which is correct. But I was uh, hoping that uh, uh, it will merge this provider configuration somehow and will make sure that provider is used properly. It was my my just uh, bad, uh, yeah, bad, g bad uh, guess, I would say. Uh, so since that time, uh, I kind of got another confirmation that yes, it's a bad idea to put it anywhere else than composition, and uh, I learned it during half hour. That's the beauty of maintaining something in the public. You don't test on your computer, you test it on someone else. <laughs> and uh, almost always I write that, hey, by the way, it's better if you don't use master branch of this repository, but stick to specific version because uh, you, you never know what kind of guy I am. Maybe I will change something tomorrow, so we'll break again something for you. When people take this uh, too seriously, then they fork this to their own repository and uh, maintain them like internally inside their organization, which is fine if they want. Okay. So get acknowledgement and support from AWS, this, uh, what's next? Yeah, maybe eventually, after three years, and mm, I don't know, tons of efforts uh, talking to AWS, they will do this. But so far there was no support from AWS. So. And uh, your ideas, I don't know what is next. Do you have any ideas? Okay. So what is your telephone question and problem? So let, I'm kind of done with all these slides, mostly. Uh, so I talked about different things, like how, how it works, uh, how modules exist, why they exist this way. And I hope you have uh, other questions which are outside of this, uh, so we can uh, just shout. Yeah. Is there 
is there any form is there any form for uh, making Terraform to destroy any resource in your system that Terraform hasn't done? I mean, we uh, tried using a Terraform de uh, destroy, but it has to have the Terraform state for destroying the resources, but we don't have it. Is there any form? I'm not sure if I understand. No, but the question was uh, what to do if Terraform does not support it at all. We did some resources uh, using uh, without using Terraform, and we want to know if there is a form for destroying that uh, resources using Terraform. For example, Terraform has the uh, Terraform destroy uh, instruction for destroying the some elements. But for destroying that elements, you have to have the Terraform state. Yeah. So that's right. So Terraform will not do anything with things which it doesn't know about. So there are multiple ways how you can instruct it to do, either by putting whatever you want into state file using Terraforming or manually edit this file and push it. Uh, but uh, most likely, if you are dealing with a system which has some sort of API already, right? So wh wh are you talking about AWS or what kind of provider are you talking about? Where these resources exist? Uh, because we did, we did them. Uh, but without using a uh, Terraform, it's like. Do you use AWS or? Eh? I don't which know which provider you use? Yes, uh, Amazon. Per excuse me, uh, Azure. There are Azure. No, no, no. Uh, it, it should be it should be easier to answer. So uh, the thing is that uh, uh, if there is like. Uh, thinking about uh, AWS, you you have possibility to uh, click in console, then import something and write configuration code for it, and uh, run plan, and then it will tell that nothing to do. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do now is that you have to do two things. First is write a state file, uh, anyhow, most likely manually, because there is I don't know any terraforming which can work with Azure. Terraforming is a Ruby gem which uh, uh, talks to AWS API, get information, and generate uh, code for you in state file. So what you need to do, you have to write uh, TF uh, or HCL code and uh, put it into, um, into your state file. There are some tricks about uh, what you should be doing with state file, because Terraform is trying to do uh, some smart things, like uh, uh, it will always try to guarantee that uh, you are changing the latest state file. So the trick there is to change serial field and increase it and then push it. So you, what you do is that first you uh, write Terraform state pull command. It will pull state file. The state file will be empty. So you will put uh, your JSON magic for your resources for Azure there. Okay. So once you put it there, then you write uh, your Terraform code, which mimics exactly these resources. So literally write in resource, Azure, blah, 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 and create with a bunch of parameters. So once you have this, then you have state file and resources. Uh, then you write Terraform state uh, push command, and you push this command to make sure that Terraform now use this version and will incrementally change it after that. <laughs> this was very uh, popular uh, request back in the days before, uh, before import command exists. So I think uh, almost three years ago, I was looking into like, how to fulfill features of Terraform uh, which are not there. For example, what to do if a resource type is not, mm, is not there or what to do if feature is missing in specific resource, like how to fulfill. But with AWS, it's quite easy. You use CloudFormation or you use AWS uh, CLI. With uh, Azure, I guess you have to use something similar. So you can invoke your 
inside your process you can invoke your Azure CLI which will do similar things by calling yeah, uh, AZ CLI but uh, yeah it's pretty advanced and it will fail miserably many times so. any other questions? Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, you said that you're not particularly uh, fond of uh, testing in models, uh, but I'd like to know a um, best practice or for testing a, a change in in a code before, let's say, deploying into production. Uh, I've read that some people have, a, let's say, um, three or two environments, maybe a dev environment, a pre or integration environment, and the production. But I don't know. Maybe even that, uh, I, I was, I would still feel uh, like uh, risky before um, applying. I mean, uh, hitting enter and hey, go to production. So, what would be your approach for a safe uh, deploy? Yeah. So, let's see. Mm, this, yeah, probably this one. So. Uh, I was solving exactly this problem multiple times and uh, over time I figured out that the best thing which works the easiest way is just to establish so-called pipeline. It's not pipeline in the way that you change something and then you promote artifacts, but since everything is versioned, your infrastructure module is versioned. So you have your dev stack with your uh, version which is right now and you have your production infrastructure which is referring to exactly the same module but with another version. So what you have is that you have a bunch of your configuration separated by different folders where you have dev stage and prod and uh, by just inspecting these uh, files, again files will be always in known location in, uh, and it will contain which version of the module you are trying to invoke. So you can always see uh, that there was version 1.1.1 and now you're changing 2.2.2 and that's exactly what your changes. So by uh, uh, like token in practice, uh, we had environments, so several AWS accounts and uh, dev stage and fraud. So in dev, failures were, were quite often. So we push something and then break apart and then we fix something it iteratively. And when we were pretty happy, then we pushed the same version which we just deployed to staging. So then we saw that, okay, now it works in staging. In 100% uh, of cases, we were confident enough that this will work in staging and in production, sorry. Because uh, we just made lots of errors in dev, made almost no errors in staging, and uh, most likely, literally, it was no problem with this chain. So sometimes we had a lot of uh, resources which were not needed. And sometimes we had possibility or we had situation where uh, uh, resource was uh, uh, was like recreated m many times than we wanted. But we had uh, version artifact, so-called, uh, which we pro promoted, uh, prom <laughs> prom prom uh, promoted, yeah. Okay, uh, with this approach, I think maybe you assume that uh, there, will, there won't be any manual configuration, let's say, in production. For example, uh, there's some um, uh, need for an emergency uh, acting, uh, I don't know, uh, something breaks in production and the, guys, uh, the guy on calls have to fix it somehow. Uh, mm, I take the scenario where he doesn't remember, let's say, to use a, a well, to change the Terraform files, the Terraform files, and then he just goes or her, he, uh, she just goes and fix it manually. And then what happens uh, with the next uh, Terraform apply? Well, I guess there will be a, a Terraform plan, but maybe who knows? There, there's a chance that the plan, let's say, uh, hey, everything will be fine. Apply. Yeah, this absolutely. This situation will happen, and there is no solution for that. Right. All right. Because uh, what else you can do against cowboy who can do whatever he wants, right? So this can happen even worse when somebody created resource which Terraform doesn't know about. So, for example, for some hotfix, somebody created new SQSQ with very specific name, and then you don't have it in development or in staging, 
but you have it in production. So then you will have. So definitely there will be situations where Terraform cannot help you. What I, I think uh, is kind of missing with the whole community right now is that uh, there are certain incentives to make process of uh, hot fixing easier for them to fix it properly. So what can be better for this guy who was on call to just fix it a little bit maybe longer but properly or make it as a routine to like sometimes we had it as a routine where we had uh, like as a last step uh, before going to bed you just uh, check that did I uh, log all of my steps yes or no and then you can oh yeah I forgot to push it uh, to this main TF file somewhere okay thank you that's a pretty nice advice this is common problem for a lot of situations where where people can change uh, something and I, I think the best way would be to just uh, give them tools to be able to break literally everything uh, in dev. So we had, uh, like, that's one of example. Uh, in one company, I was uh, introducing Spot instances exactly this way. As in dev environment, we were using Spot instances, and developers were trying to figure out why their artifacts were always lost. And then they figure out that, oh, yeah, they actually don't have to change them. They have to use Packer and build it. So this was, and they were actually saving money with spot instances. Sometimes people were angry, but price was on the very, very low level, so it was killing them quite often. Uh, so when do you decide to split? Uh, where's the split between an infrastructure model and a resource module? Like, in, for example, AWS? Yeah, so th that's always tricky to answer in very generic terms. I like to think about this uh, like one of uh, 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 indicators is when it's a good idea to think about some separation of resource module, maybe it's a whole infrastructure module now. Is, uh, so the resource module is actually easy. Is you, you always take just one, maximum two things, like security group and security group rule. Uh, or one security group and infinite amount of rules. That's one resource module. That's fine. But the infrastructure module is usually whatever describes your specific situation, what you have in the company. Let's say if it is a uh, stateful server or stateful, let's say, Jenkins server, just for fun, to make fun of Jenkins. So you have a uh, stateful Jenkins uh, infrastructure module, which consists of uh, what it has probably some auto-scaling group, launch configuration, a uh, bunch of security groups, elastic uh, EBS volumes, and all of this is very hard to, uh, to combine uh, using resource modules uh, like right now because there are limitations of resource modules, dependencies between them, which is known issue, which will be fixed later. But the whole idea is that you have common infrastructure component, which is called Jenkins Stateful Server, which in this case doesn't matter how many resources will be there, but the point is that it's one thing which is, uh, which is solving your, your task. And again, inside of this module, you may use uh, all of resource modules which are out there already, let's say to create security group without knowing in details or to create uh, some other resources. So infrastructure module usually happens uh, pretty uh, late, I would say. Any other questions? I guess, I guess there should be some questions from this part of the room. <laughs> I feel it. Or maybe from this one. <laughs> okay. Does anybody know what is cookie cutter? It's cool project. Yeah. 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 So cookie cutter. What is it? It is uh, Python. 
deep library, uh, which gets a bunch of templates and uh, it returns a bunch of uh, files generated from these templates. So you literally have file system as templating. So you can use uh, double uh, curly brackets and then some variables inside of it as file name or inside content of file name. So Templating your user data, yeah, to basically get uh, an export uh, a variable, system variable with your with your environment, production, staging, whatever. Yeah. And so this is not uh, the use case for cookie cutter. Yeah. Cookie uh -huh. cutter is uh, very helpful if you need to use variables inside file name. Mm -hmm. So let's say you create a uh, file uh, which is named uh, by user. So this means that you create thousands of files with similar content. How can you create uh, thousands of files dynamically uh, based on input value? So right now, cookie cutter is very powerful just for file generation. So what I use it for is to generate uh, Terraform templates from these visual diagrams. It's because I know that there will be this layer and I know what is name of this layer. And I know that in this uh, layer there will be files called main tf, variable tf, and output tf. But at least name of the folder, that's where I use cookie cutter for. Okay. Okay. You can look into uh, code for this generator and... Uh, yeah. I took a picture, so yeah, we'll have a look. Good. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> but uh, more uh, frequent solution is JSONnet. Does anyone use JSONnet? You're lucky. Because the JSON net works with JSON, uh, and <laughs> yes, so uh, you can generate uh, JSON files uh, using templating language. So you you pass some JSON data, and you get a bunch of similar JSON structures joined together. So this is particularly helpful uh, because uh, list uh, does not have uh, or list keeps orders as key. Well, this means that if you have user one, user this means that the whole list after user two will have to be recreated. Yeah. yeah, and this is particularly unacceptable when you are working with things which are stateful, like AWS access keys. You cannot tell that when employee with name which is somewhere in the middle leaves, that everyone who starts who goes after him will get new access key now. It doesn't work. But uh, yeah, JSONnet can help you. Uh, in 0.12, this will be uh, changed. So list will, be, will not have a uh, number inside, um, will not have. So this will be a problem with JSONnet. And uh, you don't need JSONnet uh, anymore. But uh, um, yeah. another question. Uh, can you can you use VPC pairing mm -hmm. uh, with Terraform? I mean, just yes, we we are using. It. <laughs> okay, because I never use it and I have to use it now. And I say, okay, man, this guy might know. <laughs> yeah. So the thing with uh, VPC pairing, uh, I can just uh, answer from this diagram. So think about this as infrastructure composition is where you define whatever you have at the top. You have, uh, I don't know if it's possible to do now with. Uh, inter-region pairing, but uh, pretend that you have different providers, different, um, uh, what is it, D different uh, AWS provider. Uh, no, you have, uh, yes, region. So uh, when you have VPC pairing, you have infrastructure module called VPC pairing, and uh, uh, you can specify who is it. Is it acceptor or is it requester? So when you specify, uh, then you have two infrastructure modules next to each other, and the point is that you can, uh, if they belong to different accounts, then you can override provider configuration on the composition layer for them. Because sometimes uh, it's pretty sensitive information that 
one is owned by mega cool organization, boss who doesn't allow to do anything, uh, so that's why uh, his super secret credentials will have to be used in order to accept your request. So provider configuration happens on the infrastructure composition layer on the very top, but uh, infrastructure module which does the whole VPC pairing, AWS VPC pairing resource and acceptor is happening here. Similar situation is happening, you know, like one of uh, practices is when you manage Route 53 zones, uh, is that uh, zone by itself is pretty a sensitive thing, right? Mm -hmm. And if you have a project uh, or organization domain where you cannot allow everyone to have access to uh, to be able to do whatever they want with uh, Route 53 zones. So one of solution which uh, I saw people doing was to just uh, delegate either subdomain or give them a way to, dis um, to discover zone ID from the infrastructure module. So the infrastructure module will just know that, hey, I should uh, create a record inside this zone ID. And it will just use uh, uh, AWS zo zone, no, RAW 53 zone to discover it and uh, use it inside the module. Yep. Uh, hi. Thanks a lot for your for your uh, presentation. Uh, I have just not not a question, but just an experience. I uh, it was about talking about the opinionated tools. Uh, I I understand you know. Hi, sorry. Uh, I think I don't know you know the tool COPS with a K that uh, mm. generates a Kubernetes. Yeah, uh, sure. Deployment on as on AWS. Uh, so they decide to uh, they um, I w when I try to use it, uh, it worked perfectly actually against AWS, no problem. But they also have a uh, export to Terraform module, and in my deployment it didn't work. So the idea is I have to invest. A time ad. I didn't have to understand what the Terraform code they did. I this is not. I mean, uh, I understand you. If you have to debug Terraform files out from an output for a, a tool you don't know, you finally don't. You in my in my case, I I didn't try a lot of. Uh, I didn't try a lot to understand the generated uh, files from COPS. I say, okay, just redeploy, it works, okay, forget about it. So I don't know if maybe, I insist this is not a question, this is something like if everybody, every project, every opinionated project reinvent the wheel and they generate a Terraform files that you have to understand Terraform and you have to understand the tool, Maybe they won't. They won't you, I, in my case, I didn't use Terraform to deploy my my infrastructure. Mm. But just yeah, I think uh, first of all, thanks for pointing uh, this uh, situation with COPS. I didn't know about this uh, uh, possibility of export, but a uh, long time ago I saw code which uh, they generate, and uh, it reminds me some obfuscator, which we used back in the days to save uh, time in JavaScript or to save space in JavaScript. So uh, uh, one of the things which, uh, so y your question is pretty broad, or your, your statement is pretty broad. <laughs> but, uh, I, I think uh, um, when you, so one situation which uh, I totally understand, and you are expert in uh, Terraform, you, at least you know what is it. Can you imagine how people are struggling when they get started with Terraform? So they say, I mean, their boss comes to them and say, Kubernetes. They go to Kubernetes uh, in Google. They download COPS. They run COPS. They run whatever they want. They're afraid to touch it after that because it's, I mean, it just runs from first attempt. Mm -hmm. For me, it didn't work from first attempt, to be honest. But uh, the situation with uh, the whole uh, Terraform modules generation, to my understanding is that, I mean, 
maybe that's just my experience, maybe that's my pain point, but uh, I don't want people to write Terraform code, to be honest. I want to have uh, tools which tell them very early that, hey, by the way, this code sucks because you are going to limit or you are going to have hard times. Mm -hmm. Or when people think that they're going to be very smart right now because they just invented these things and they write something unmaintainable. It's uh, very often when, right, so right now there are very few tools, one is TFLint, which tells you uh, later there will be a feature inside Terraform which will help you to make sure that you actually wrote what you expect so there will be better error messages and better validation in time before you actually hit save and so on. So uh, I don't think uh, if we uh, let uh, tool, I mean COPS, uh, to generate Terraform, uh, I mean of course it will be obfuscated code. So I don't think there is magic solution. There is one uh, feature, not, not feature, one uh, related challenge is imagine that you was using COPS and then they decided to change something, let's say, in name instruction. So you, are, you, know, you run Terraform now, so your uh, plan will tell that, hey, a bunch of resources will have to be deleted yeah. and uh, something will have to be created. That's not what you expect to do. So this means that Terraform should have much easier uh, ways or much more features related to refactoring. So it, it has to have some sort of smart guess between, hey, I think this is actually a rename. Are you sure that this is, or that you want to destroy this resource and create exactly the same resource? So that's happening with uh, refactoring, especially in open source. I saw this quite often. When I change something, somebody said, oh, you broke everything for me. I mean, that's, that's life. So just uh, to finalize this one, I think that the idea of people writing Terraform modules is dead without uh, restricting them and without guidelines clearly. Otherwise, we'll just make another uh, Ansible playbook. I mean, you, can, you, you have Ansible lint, which can guarantee that syntax is okay, number of spaces is okay, but logic inside of it is totally up to developer what to write there. So And just uh, another, yeah. Hi. Uh, maybe it's quite a uh, quite basic uh, question, but um, I would like to know how how uh, will you face the problem of of having a, a three possible possible values in a conditional uh, when I'm doing a count uh, and I'm going to provision a, a one instance in, in a AWS uh, and I'm trying to um, uh, give it uh, three possible values in, in its stacks uh, well, what kind of values are you talking yeah, Is it three oh, different uh, totally different values yeah yeah, depending on on some um, uh, variable, I'm passing it by a pipeline or something like that. Yeah, right. So currently, uh, uh, what is it? Con conditional conditional parameters or condi conditional arguments. So what that means is that you have resource block, and uh, you can specify in count, uh, as you say var blah 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 or one minus blah 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 this is like gonna to work fine for two elements right and uh, what you're gonna to um, what, what y people are making uh, is that they use local and declare whatever complex statement they want for three for five for 25 different variables there and then use local uh, inside of each so local can be good short form of this. But uh, uh, I think, uh, actually, uh, I don't know if it's relevant for the most of people, but uh, uh, there are a lot of situations when you have to create resources with totally different configurations. Because, uh, as an example, you specify, uh, if it's with EC2 instance, uh, example can be that you have 
EC2 instance with network, uh, network interfaces and without network interfaces. So you cannot mix them. So you cannot say network interfaces equal null. It will be possible in 0.12, but now you cannot do this. So that this means that you have to copy-paste the same code with network interface and without it, and maybe something else, and so on. And then play with count in each of these. Right. Count equal and then local and your magic statement which you calculate somehow. Uh, the trick here is that uh, when you do output for specific elements, uh, then you have to use element from concat list, from concat, from one, two, three, with stars in it, and then something else. So this means that you put uh, your conditional, uh, conditional concatenation of empty lists uh, into one. So this means that uh, there will be always, at most, one element. I described this uh, in, I don't know, pretty good details, I think, in uh, Terraform best practices. So also on Terraform best practices, I am describing things like, uh, similar to what you just said, they are uh, pretty unknown for the majority of people who don't work with generalization of things. So a lot of people are happy with just happy path, where they read documentation, copy example, put some basic uh, arguments, get just attributes which they need, that's it. The funny thing will happen is that if you do, let's say, S3 bucket, which accepts approximately 15 uh, attributes, and most of these are optional, but not in this combination, and not in that combination, and so on. So uh, that's one of the uh, examples which I'm going to uh, put on workshop. I have workshop uh, with uh, similar on Terraform best practices, and uh, I don't want to write this code myself, so I want to have people. Uh, so we'll see. I made repositories uh, on Terraform AWS modules. If workshop will be successful, we'll have uh, S3 uh, bucket created in bunch of combinations by these people. So we'll Thank see. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think it's, it was uh, the last question. Uh, thanks a lot for. Uh, for attendant, uh, we have some pizzas. Uh, I think it's time to. This is the last slide, uh, or pre-last slide. Uh, so if you didn't know about Terraform, but you really want to get, I can just say how I learn new things. So I read read me. This is the most popular page. <laughs> no, really, uh, I learn a lot about technologies just by following read me. So read me on Terraform and AWS provider is uh, the most popular website uh, at all. So I visit it daily, uh, talk to people who change something there, why they change it, uh, when are you going to change this because this will break that, and so on. So this is like uh, five minutes a day, but stay on top of different things. So that's one thing. And uh, I'm quite sure you didn't read this book, but you should read this one. I reviewed this one, but not this one. I was technical reviewer on this book, but it was not so successful and the, as this one. So I recommend actually this one. <laughs> yeah, because it, it, it's a little bit, uh, mm, it, it gives uh, more information than it's possible to give on Meetup. In particular, it covers some topic about how to actually cooperate with your developers in the company or in your team, uh, who should write this code, who should execute this code, and so on. And yeah, Evgeny writes very well, much better than I can speak. Yeah, I will definitely do this, yeah. But you can take photos of this as well. <laughs> <laughs>